in a crisis, our mental health matters. Our mental health matters normally, but especially when we find ourselves in the midst of a crisis like we're all facing now, the inner life becomes increasingly important because it's all we have and it's the center of who we are and our life. For many years, Canada has been facing a hidden crisis. Increasingly over time, it's become more public and I think it's been very helpful, but by and large, we've been facing a private crisis and that's one called the mental health crisis. That is the deeper parts of us, despite the fact that our economy has been good and healthy and there are jobs and things like that, we're not actually whole, despite the technological developments like the internet and, and phones and computers and social media and all that stuff, we're still feeling like we're not okay. Enter COVID-19 and we find ourselves put in a spot where all of those coping mechanisms that we've been using to upkeep our lives for the last number of years either have become unaffordable for many of us because of our economy's difficulties now or are just um, unfulfilling and unhelpful. And so in the midst of all of this crisis, we're in a global one, now I'm starting to have a personal internal crisis. And we're gonna see this more and more in the coming days and weeks. That what is surfacing is that the real me, the real you, not your job, not your hobbies, or your retire, retirement plan, but you, is coming to the surface. And with it, the truth that we have all been working to try to avoid through busyness and through jobs and through consumerism and through entertainment, which is, I'm not whole inside. I'm not okay. My mental health, my thoughts, my emotions, my soul, the intangible me, my spirit, is poor, is grieving, is weak, lacking resources, even helpless to create the change that I need and desire in my life and that I'm starving on the inside for a deeper, inner, more satisfying fulfillment. Now hear the words of Jesus. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. This is the invitation of Jesus for those who would follow his way to be honest about the fact that my spirit, my mental health is poor, that I'm mourning and grieving inside things that I don't even know or understand, that I feel quite meek, I'm, I'm, I'm quite weak and helpless when it comes to changing these things inside of me and I am hungry and thirsty and motivated to find a new way of living. And Jesus is offering that way. And for those who follow him, he says, we'll inherit the kingdom of heaven, meaning a, a, a kingdom of goodness, a way of goodness, a life of goodness, that the places of our hearts that are grieving will be comforted, that the meek shall inherit the earth, have much to enjoy and build in and explore and, and have a future. And that those who are hungry and thirsty and ready for this shall be satisfied. That's the promise of Jesus. Now, for those of us at Christ Church here in Oceanside on Vancouver Island, we have found that and are continuing to find that. That especially in the midst of this difficult trial that we're all facing we need new ways old ways that work and work the way we need them to so we want to invite you to come to church with us today online as you are today wherever you are today to receive the way of jesus so i'm pastor ryan i'm stoked to welcome you to be a part of this with us so we're going to begin our service now 
and, and invite you to come along with us. So let's begin with the opening. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and blessed be, blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Now this part of our service, we typically give what we call our testimony, which is our church says this all together as an invitation to you to join in to find what we have found in Jesus. In Jesus's life, our hearts are fully seen. In Jesus's death, we finally have a solution. In Jesus's resurrection, we freely rest from striving. In Jesus's ascension, we are forever safe. Now this next prayer is called the Collect for Purity. It's a very old prayer. But what's happening at this point is we are hearing God calling out to us saying, where are you? Where have you gone? Where have you been searching for satisfaction and fulfillment and solutions in the world? Where are you have been eating and drinking, but it's just not satisfying? Where did you go? Come back to me and I will satisfy you. And so we pray this prayer as a way of turning back to God. So let's pray this together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. This is the good way, the good way of living, the fulfilling way of living, the fruitful way of living. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us and write both these, your laws, in our hearts, we beseech you. Now we're going to do some worship together today, which I'll be honest, I haven't led worship for quite some time and for good reason. But uh, we will do our best to kind of work our way through this and, and hopefully it serves you um, as we turn our hearts and turn our minds and turn our bodies to being satisfied in Jesus.
God's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. I survey the wondrous cross on which the
pray together the collect for this week. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise. That among the swift and varied changes of this world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I'm going to take a minute now to pray for the children of our congregations and our homes and our families. Kids, we're missing you like crazy. Uh, again, our girls miss gathering together. They're going to be very sad that we're not all together as a church. But just know that uh, Jackie and I, we're praying for you and thinking of you constantly. And if you ever want to write us a note or an email or something, please feel free to do that and we'll write you back, okay? Now let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of these wonderful children in our church. We are just so honored to have them as, as part of our family in you. And so, Lord, we pray for a blessing to be upon them, especially in this time, peace, comfort, that they would feel your closeness and your nearness in this time, that they would sleep well, that they would enjoy this time of being close together as a family and most of all that they would come to see you to know you and to walk with you and we pray this in the name of jesus and everyone said amen well we're now going to do our bible readings this morning our first reading comes from psalm chapter 116 i'm going to preach from this one today uh, it was one of our readings uh, through the daily office through the week and i just felt like I would love to take some time together on it this Sunday. So let me read that one first. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. Even when I said in my alarm, all, my, all mankind are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord, is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Our second reading this morning is a gospel reading, and the gospel reading is going to be from John chapter 8, beginning in verse 1 through verse 11. And so I will read that for us together today. So John chapter 8. Early in the morning, he, Jesus, came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone, each, to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. 
Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman, standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. This is our story, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now at this point, we give our uh, confession of faith. This is the confession of the faith that we have given for thousands of years as Christians through all types of different seasons and calamities, hardships and persecutions. This is a summary of the gospel of Jesus. And this is what we put our hope in, our trust in, and what we will depend upon in the coming days this week. So Christ Church Oceanside, do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, and the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. I was not anticipating the response that we received to our sermon last week. Um, many people joined us that don't normally join us. Um, and from all over the place, but especially here on the island. Um, we've had way, way more views than we had anticipated. And so I just want to welcome people from all over the place. Maybe you haven't been to church in a long time. Um, and I really appreciated getting emails from you um, and messages from you to talk about how the way of Jesus is resonating with what you need in your life right now. So special welcome to those who are in Euculet and Tofino and Port Alberni, and then of course, Qualicum Beach and Parksville, Manus Bay and Nanaimo, um, and wherever else you're, you're joining us from today, um, we are um, humbled and honored to have you with us. Now, I mentioned that I want to spend our time looking at Psalm 116 together. And it's because I, I think I can give these messages about the importance of the heart and how Jesus um, really tries to push people to go, I actually care less about what you're doing on the outside and I care about more about what's going on on the inside. Because what's on the inside determines what happens on the outside. And so Jesus is consistently pushing people to go, where are you really at inside? What, what's the content of your, your heart, your feelings, your emotions, your soul? What is your mind ruminating on constantly? And let me save you there that you would experience and enjoy salvation in all of the other areas of life. Because that part of you is dictating what's happening in all those other areas. And so I myself will find myself tempted to move away from this stuff. Where I just go, ah, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm the only one that has these issues and everybody else is good. But then hearing all of you respond and saying, you know, being in isolation has really highlighted how much stuff is inside of me, what I'm really struggling with. That this is the big stuff that's been going on in my life for years and years, but I just tried to work through it. I just tried to push past it. Um, so then to come across this passage in our normal daily readings and prayer time, I just thought is a great picture of how this works in the way of Jesus and how it's so important. So I'm just going to start working through 
the verses here in Psalm 116. The Psalms are our prayer book. Essentially, they teach us how to pray, how to relate to God, what we're allowed to say. Because sometimes we think, I don't know what God wants me to say or what he wants me to communicate to him or what I should ask for. But the Psalms help us go. It's This is really just raw, desperate humanity interacting with a good and gracious God. So verse 1 begins like this. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice. So hear that for a second. A big reason why we love Jesus, and there's lots of reasons we love Jesus, but a big reason is he hears me. I feel heard and I feel understood and I feel known. This is really the beginning of the gospel. When Jesus comes into the picture, this is the first thing that he generates in us in our response to him. He has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. And so this is what we've been talking about the last number of weeks is this idea that there are parts in our hearts and our lives that we have been suppressing, trying to control, trying to just maintain them, trying to just keep them quiet deep down inside. But when Jesus comes in, He changes everything. Where our society doesn't give a lot of room and doesn't give a lot of priority for that, it tends to only give you value based on what you can earn and achieve and accomplish and produce. Jesus comes in and does something very different. He draws out those raw and intimate places within us that are asking, pleading is the word here, for help. And that's really what's going on inside of us, isn't it? My emotions are calling out for help. I have pain. I have anxiety. I have fears. I have things I don't know about who I am and about my life and about problems that I'm facing and how something that happened yesterday really jarred me and broke me inside. So when my emotions are crying out for help, then my mind tends to go, because this is the way we're taught in our society, well, what are you, Ryan, going to do about this? How are you going to fix this? How are you going to make this better? And so it turns it back onto my heart, and my heart goes, I don't know, I was asking for help. I was asking, that I need new resources here. I can't fix this myself. And so then when our brain responds back and says, you can do this, you got this, we got to figure something out for ourselves, That makes us a very desperate person, doesn't it? And a desperate person who's going, I actually don't have the resources and I don't have the help to fix this myself. Where do I go? And the idea of bringing somebody in to help you, to help you understand the nitty gritty, to help you heal, to come to clarity and to receive the help that you need is really scary. And we have great counselors out there. But even now, how do we get access to them? So it pushes this issue of like, where do I go for help? So our old and kind of unhelpful coping mechanisms are going to represent themselves. Maybe things you got, you thought you got rid of when, you know, you became an adult. You're like, man, I haven't done this since I was a teen. But like uh, our statistically speaking, uh, pornography use is skyrocketing. Because people have nothing else to do and nowhere to go with their comforts and with their fears and their, their, their need to be comforted. Our, um, our alcohol and smoking weed and things like that, we're trying to dull senses because we don't know what to do with these places. Jesus is different because what he does is he brings us to say, that part of you matters. That part of you is valuable and that part of you has a voice and it needs to be heard. And its cries for help are legit. They're legitimate requests. So verse 2, what's the next thing that comes up? This is the psalmist is writing about God. It says, because he, God, inclined his ear to me. So not only does God hear the voice of those deep, desperate parts inside of you and hear their cries for help, but he inclines his ear to them. He leans in to what your heart is feeling and saying and asking for. He's leaning in towards you. The psalmist then goes on to say, Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. 
Basically, therefore, he's saying, I'm convinced because this is my experience, because I see that this is who God is in Jesus, I'm, I'm actually going to keep calling on him. I'm going to call on him a lot. I'm going to involve him in every emotion and in every thought. And this is important because what we have now is we have God in the person of Jesus, who's not just some historical entity, right? Just some interesting fact about the past. And he's not an impersonal spirit. I think kind of our new age spiritualism is this idea that you just kind of find general comfort from general spiritual things in the universe. But what we're actually longing for is a deeply personal and intimate interaction with deeply personal parts of us. So what we find in Jesus is God inclining himself to hear the voice of the deep things in our hearts. And that what we experience, what we find in him, is that he's trustworthy. So much so that my mind, what I want my mind to learn, is that the best, healthiest, most responsible thing I can do with my emotions, because that's what I'm struggling to know what to do with, is to go to God. Because God is inclining his ear towards those feelings of what's going on in my life. So if I've got pain, if I've got trauma, if I'm fearful about COVID stuff, if I'm feeling isolated and alone and unloved and unvalued and helpless and desperate, every one of those feelings, God has inclined himself towards hearing. And that's the most natural thing for us to do. Have you ever noticed that your emotions and your thoughts never stop? That's why we like social media, internet, Netflix stuff, is because we're trying to keep them busy. <laughs> kind of like a, a little toddler in the house going, oh, geez, watch something on TV so, you can, so I can get some things done. That's kind of how we treat our emotions. But they're, the reason they're always running and always going is because we were meant to find an infinite resource and conversation to respond to those thoughts and feelings. God, we were always meant to converse with him. We're always meant to involve him to what's going on in us and what's happening in our world, but also to be fulfilled in that relationship. Now, verse three, the snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol, or the deep, dark grave, laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. So because of what the psalmist is finding in God, that God's inclining towards those parts, not only is he going to make a logical decision to say, this is always going to be where I go with them, but he's now being desperately honest about what's really inside there. It feels like death for me. It feels like a grave down there of sorrow and loss and disappointment and despair about the future. And there, that is a place of suffering and distress and anguish. Who likes to feel that? Not me. I hate that stuff. I hate feeling, I hate suffering. I hate distress. I hate anguish. I do not enjoy those things. And so because of that, I want to ignore those things. And I want to avoid them. And I want to hide from them. And I want to stay as busy as possible to not feel those things. The problem is, in isolation, like we are now stuck in our homes, you run out of resources, don't you? You run out of coping mechanisms to keep those things down. Now, if we allow ourselves to feel what's there, to let it have a voice, right? to let it be, to humanize it and go, you're actually allowed to feel this way. You're allowed to express it and you're allowed to say it. God's response to that part of you is not to shun you, to shame you, to reject you. That reading we had from John chapter 8 where the Pharisees come and they throw an adulterous woman at the feet of Jesus and go, what are you going to do with her? That's kind of what our brain does when it's like, fine, 
You want to come up, you want to express yourself, you want to talk about re what's really down there, and then throws it out and says, this is it. I was abused when I was a child. I was rejected. I feel unloved in the relationship I'm in now. I'm so broken and desperate. I need drugs. I need alcohol to numb it. Let's be honest. Let's put you out there. And what's God going to say to that? The response that the psalmist helps us come to see is that God's not going to shun it, shame it, and reject it. And he's not going to tell you to just suck it up and get back to work. Watch what happens with the deep, dark places. Verse 4. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul from this anguish. It cries out to God for help. It's all bared out saying, okay, God, what are you going to do about this? Verse 5. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. What's expected to happen here is God's going to show his true colors when he sees our deep darkness. So what's God's character? What are his true colors when it's all out there? God's character is gracious, understanding, empathetic. He comes down into your mess, joins you there. But it says that God's righteous, so he's good. You find his response to those parts of you. When you let them have a voice and you let yourself hear the voice of Jesus speak to those parts of your heart, you're going to find that Jesus is gracious. Oh, man, sorry. And that he's, he's good. He's not going to hurt you. He's not going to harm you. He's not going to beat you. He's going to be good to you. And he's going to be merciful is the third thing, which means he's going to be helpful. He's going to be gracious and good and helpful. Verse 6, the Lord preserves the simple. What does that mean? The Lord preserves the simple. Basically, the point is this. God helps, preserves, fights for for those who are in anguish and suffering and hardship, God will preserve them when they're simple. Meaning, they're not complicated, trying to hide things and cover things up. They're not trying to manipulate the situation. They're not trying to work their way out of it with new schemes and shortcuts and ideas. And let's try this and let's do this. Let's work harder here. He's looking for simple people to help. And I'll be totally honest with you. That's why I'm in this. It's because I'm, I'm simple. I need simple solutions for really big problems inside of me. I'm not trying to cover things up anymore. I'm not trying to manipulate it. I'm not trying to work the angles. I'm simple going, yeah, I'm, I'm broken. I'm hurting. And I need some help. Would you be the one to do that? When I was brought low, he saved me. There are people that refuse to be brought low. Even in all this, I'm going to keep it together. I'm going to be strong. I'm going to, go, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to maximize this opportunity. But this, the reality of this situation is a healthy response to COVID globally is to let yourself be brought low and go, I can't fix all this. I can't solve all this. I need to simplify right now. That's a healthy response. And it lets God be God. Verse 7. Return, O my soul, to the invisible, deep inner parts of me, my thoughts, my emotions, everything inside. Return, O my soul, to your rest. Because I'm simple. I'm not striving. Because I'm simple, I'm not working this thing. Because I'm simple, I'm not even going to try and be so, I'm not even going to be desperate. I'm just going to sit. I'm going to breathe. I'm going to rest. Because I'm in the company of someone who is strong, who is gracious, who is good, and who is merciful and wants to be helpful for me. I'm going to let him do his work. 
Why can the psalmist rest? Verse 7, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. He's speaking to himself. He's actually having a conversation with God, his prayers, and with his heart, with himself. He's saying, God's going to deal bountifully with you. You can rest. He's generous, and he's going to do far more than we can do. We're going to rest. Verse 8, for you delivered my soul from death. My soul, my inner parts from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, from exhaustion and from running, trying to make things work. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. The soul of the psalmist is starting to get more hopeful again, to go, he's delivered me from that death inside of me. My eyes aren't weeping so much anymore because I've let them weep with him. My feet aren't stumbling as I'm trying to make my way in the dark here. Instead, I'm going to walk with him. He's got my back. And in the land of the living, he's going to take care of me. He's going to bring me out of the land of the, of the dead, of the walking dead. And he's going to bring me into the land of the living. I believed even when I spoke. I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. Even when we say things out loud that are a bit like dr dramatized, even when it's the worst case scenario, and we say, I, my life is in ruins. I am screwed. I have got no hopes and everyone is out to get me. When I confess that, that's how I feel. I can still believe in him. That I... I believe in him enough to be honest about what I'm feeling inside. Verse 12, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Our experiences, and I experience this daily, is that he will take me from that depth of darkness that I'm feeling. Depression, self-hatred anxiety, worry, um, all of it, all those feelings through in prayer and in communion and relationship with him, through even just reading a psalm like this, this is what happened to me the other day, it moves me out of that grave and into a place of life in the land of the living where I actually want to do good. I feel loved, I feel secure, I feel safe. I feel like he's with me and in me and for me and functioning through me. And that makes me want to do good things. So the psalmist asks that question. What can I do to show you how thankful I am and how I love you and how I adore you? How, what can I do from the benefits that you've given me? And is his heart goes to show, I want to say my vows in front of all the people. And this is why we do church, is we want to give our confession. We want to sing the songs. We want to say it out loud to go, Jesus saved me this week in, in very legitimate, specific, and meaningful ways. Verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. He will care about us to the very end and through eternity. Verse 16, O oh Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. And that's this picture. I've been saved from the chains and the bonds of my own soul and the death that was inside of it. And I've been made a son. And you've been made a daughter. And I, I consider myself a servant of him because he saved me. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'm not a pastor because I'm a good pastor. <laughs> I'm not... I'm not a pastor because I'm good at this. I'm, I'm a pastor because, because I'm thankful that he saved me and continues to save me. I do this because I go, I don't think anything else I've found in the world works. And if that's how you feel, I want you to feel something that works, changes everything. It saves me in more ways than I knew I needed or wanted. And because of that, I come to you on a Sunday. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people because I owe him everything. Because he's 
not only mended my heart, but he's captured my heart. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. Jesus works. The way of Jesus satisfies. And in this dry time, I want you to find that and have that. So what might that look like for you? I think it's some quiet moments, unplugged, no TV, no social media, no phones, no news, daily, to ask your heart, where are you at? What do you feel? You're allowed to have a voice and to do it knowing that you don't have to handle what comes out. You don't have to fix it. You don't have to contain it and you don't have to suppress it. Instead, you're gonna let it come out because you're gonna let yourself try to let Jesus speak to those places. To let Jesus meet those parts of your heart, hear their voice, and then that you would hear his voice in return begin to calm them. And so there's four key things that the way of Jesus always does. The first is to draw out the heart. So he wants to know what's in there. So for you to allow yourself to be honest there is already a miracle that Jesus is producing in your life. Right? Because you couldn't have done that before. So you're going to let your heart come out and be known. That's what his life does, his humanity. The second thing is Jesus dies for us. So the cross. The cross becomes the destination of all the death that is in that grave of your heart. All the pain, all the sorrow, all the screw-ups you have, the sins you committed, the fears you have, um, all the, the work that you've been doing, trying to take care of yourself, that's a sin. That's been killing you. All of it goes to the cross, is crucified with Jesus, dies with Jesus, and is buried with Jesus. So already a solution is starting to unfold. Do you see that? You're already healthier than you were because you're allowing your heart to come out and you're giving it a destination in the cross of Jesus where it's buried. And your heart is no longer the grave. Jesus' grave is the resting place of all those things. Then the resurrection of Jesus is the third thing. And the resurrection is to bring about new life. So forgiveness for all the sins that were in there, to give you affirmation and love and validation where you're no longer a desperate son or daughter or sorry a desperate orphan living in the world trying to take care of yourself trying to earn value earn affirmation earn love that's all dead now instead you're adopted so you're adopted by god himself in jesus the son and so what that means is that you are his beloved you're cherished and valued, honored, respected, affirmed, loved, and enjoyed by God. That should fill that spot. What was once a grave now becomes a garden of resurrection. And in that garden of resurrection is truth that I'm loved, that I was created and enjoyed by God. He wishes to provide for me, care for me, love me enjoy me you can live just in that spot did you know that that's actually where we want to live most in these times i'm enjoyed loved cared for provided for and then the fourth thing is the ascension of jesus that means he ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of god that he is king over all things so i can rest knowing that his kingdom reigns over all of this and his, his goodness is going to continue. So I'm a part of his kingdom. I'm not alone in this world. I'm a part of his church, his people. That's his temple. I'm a part of them. I'm not alone in all of this. I have the very spirit of God living in me. So God's dwelling with me now. I'm not on my own dealing with my graves. I'm now in unity with God, living with him in right relationship. And I'm a part of spreading that goodness to the world. My occupation, my friendships, my neighbors. 
that I'm made for doing good things in the world and for spreading Jesus everywhere I go. And by that, spreading peace and love and forgiveness and drawing other people's hearts out that they would have a voice. That is your call. That's what you're made for, for restoring all things with Jesus. So that's just a taste. So remember those four things. The life of Jesus draws out the heart. The death of Jesus kills what's killing us. The res resurrection of Jesus fills us with new life. And the ascension of Jesus gives us a new purpose. Right? That's the good news of Jesus. Isn't that great? So let's go to a time of confession where we confess what's inside of us. And then um, we'll continue to move together through the liturgy. So take a moment for private confession. What are you feeling? What are you thinking? What are you realizing and seeing within your own heart that's killing you? That's wrong. It's not a good way of living. It's not the right way of living. It's not satisfying. And allow your heart to have a voice to speak to Jesus even right now. Let's pray the confession together. Lord, remember not our offenses, nor the offenses of our forebears. Spare us, good Lord. Spare your people whom you have redeemed with your precious blood. Spare us, good Lord. From all evil and mischief, from sin, from the crafts and assaults of the devil, from your wrath and from everlasting condemnation, Good Lord, deliver us. From all deadly sin and from the deceits of the world, the flesh and the devil, good Lord, deliver us. From all false doctrine, heresy and schism, from hardness of heart and contempt of your word and commandment, good Lord, deliver us. Now hear his response. It's gracious, it's good, and it's merciful. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness. And keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now we're going to take some time to pray. Uh, for the world around us, for everything that's going on, for the weak amongst us, and for those especially at risk and those who are serving so well in our society today. So you'll just repeat after me the, the section, He has carried our sorrows. Surely He has borne our griefs. He has carried our sorrows. He was despised. He was rejected. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He has carried our sorrows. He was pierced for our sins, bruised for no fault but ours. He has carried our sorrows. His punishment has won our peace, and by his wounds we are healed. He has carried our sorrows. We had all strayed like sheep, but the Lord has laid on him the guilt of us all. He has carried our sorrows. According to the power of Christ's cross, we pray especially for those who are older in years and are susceptible to this virus. Lord, keep them safe in this time. Keep them safe from the virus. But most of all, be with them in the depths of their heart that they would not feel alone and not feel abandoned. For those of you that live alone and, and are younger, would you feel the nearness of the presence of Jesus to be with you? And Lord, we want to pray especially for our care workers, Lord, the doctors, the nurses, the administrators that are working tirelessly. 
Lord, strengthen them. Give them inner resources that they didn't have before. Strengthen their mortal bodies. Protect them from the virus. How would your goodness and mercy be upon them as they express your character to the sick and to the dying? Lord, be with our government. Give them wisdom and understanding, both provincially um, and federally and municipally. Lord, would you be with them? Give them understanding. Give them wisdom. Help them to do what is right and what is good. Lord, we even pray for other nations and especially the United States right now. Lord, help them not to choose money and wealth and the economy over lives, over the elderly. Lord, give them compassion and understanding and mercy. Give them your heart. And Lord, be with all the essential workers that are working tirelessly in our communities, or the, uh, the grocery stores and gas stations and all these different places. Lord, be with them, be near with them, comfort them, strengthen them, love them as you've loved us. And so we pray this now. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Surely he has borne our griefs. He has carried our sorrows. Amen. Well, now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, and let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, before the blessing, uh, in the coming weeks, we're going to be trying to do some things through a program called Zoom. So I think we're going to try and do daily prayer in some way, shape, or form together in the next week or two, where we'd be able to show up on the screen together. You'd see everyone's faces, and we would do either morning or maybe evening prayer, whichever is going to work better, um, led by me or led by others within the church. Um, and just please don't be afraid to reach out to someone um, our pastoral care workers in the congregation are doing such a great job. We're so thankful for them and so proud of them. Um, and let's together continue to go to Christ, following the hours of prayer each day, and be with him in, in the word um, and in our prayers and in the spirit together. So now uh, for the blessing. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. I can't tell you enough how much I love you, dear friends. And so I look forward to, to hearing from you and seeing you as soon as possible. Bless you. Have a great week.